When I was a boy, I wanted to maximize my impact on the world. And I was smart enough to realize that I am not very smart. And that I have to build a machine that learns to become much smarter than myself, such that it can solve all the problems that I cannot solve myself, and I can retire. And my first publication on that dates back 30 years, 1987, my diploma thesis, where I already tried to solve the grand problem of AI, not only build a machine that learns a little bit here and learns a little bit there, but also learns to improve the learning algorithm itself. And the way it learns, the way it learns, and so on recursively, without any limits, except the limits of logics and physics. And I'm still working on the same old thing, and I'm still pretty much saying the same thing, except that now more people are listening. Because the learning algorithms that we have developed on the way to this goal, they are now on 3,000 million smartphones. And all of you have them in your pockets. What you see here are the five most valuable companies of the Western world. Apple, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon. And all of them are emphasizing that AI, artificial intelligence, is central to what they are doing. And all of them are using heavily the deep learning methods that my team has uh, developed since the early 90s in Munich, in Munich and in Switzerland, especially something which is called the long short-term memory. Has anybody in this room ever heard of the long short-term memory or the LSTM? Hands up. Anybody ever heard of that? Okay. Has anybody never heard of the LSTM? Okay. I see we have a third group in this room <laughs> who didn't understand the question. <laughs> the LSTM is a little bit like your brain. It's an artificial neural network which also has neurons and in your brain you've got about 100 billion neurons. And each of them is connected to roughly 10,000 other neurons on average. Which means that you have got a million billion connections. And each of these connections has a strength which says how much does this neuron over here influence that neuron over there at the next time step. And in the beginning all these connections are random and the system knows nothing. But then, through a smart learning algorithm, it learns from lots of examples to translate the incoming data, such as video through the cameras, or audio through the microphones, or pain signals through the pain sensors. It learns to translate that into output actions, because some of these neurons are output neurons that control speech muscles and finger muscles. And only through experience it can learn to solve all kinds of interesting problems such as driving a car. Or do the speech recognition on your smartphone. Because whenever you take out your smartphone, an Android phone for example, and you speak to it and you say, okay Google, show me the shortest way to Milano. Then it understands your speech. Because there is an LSTM in there, which has learned to understand speech. Every 10 milliseconds, 100 times a second, new inputs are coming from the microphone and then uh, are translated after thinking into letters, which is then a um, question to the search engine. And it has learned to do that by listening to lots of speech from women, from men, all kinds of people. and that's how since 2015, Google speech recognition is now much better than it used to be. The basic LSTM cell looks like that. 
I don't have the time to explain that, but at least I can list uh, the names of the brilliant students in my lab who made that possible. And what are the big companies doing with that? Well, speech recognition is only one example. If you are on Facebook, is anybody on Facebook? Facebook? Okay. Hmm. Are you sometimes clicking at the translate button because somebody sent you something in a foreign language and then you can translate it? Is anybody doing that? Yeah. Whenever you do that, you are waking up, again, a long short-term memory, an LSTM, which has learned to translate text in one language into translated text. And Facebook is doing that four billion times a day. So every, 50, every second, 50,000 sentences are being translated by an LSTM working for Facebook. And another 50,000 in this second, and another 50,000. And to see how much this thing is now permeating the modern world, just note that almost 30% of the awesome computational power for inference in all these Google data centers, all these data centers of Google all over the world, is used for LSTM, almost 30%. If you have an Amazon Echo, you can ask it questions, and it answers you. And the voice that you hear, it's not a recording. It's an LSTM network, which has learned from training examples to sound like a female voice. If you have an iPhone, and you're using the quick type, it's trying to predict what you want to do next, given all the previous context of what you did so far. Again, that's an LSTM, which has learned to do that. So it's on a billion iPhones. You are a large audience by my standards. But when we started this work, decades ago, in the early 90s, only few people were interested in that, because computers were so slow and you couldn't do so much with it. And I remember I gave a talk at a conference, and there was just one single person in the audience, a young lady. I said, um, young lady, it's very embarrassing, but apparently today I'm going to give this talk just to you. And she said, um, OK, but please hurry. I am the next uh, speaker. <laughs> Since then, we have greatly profited from the fact that every five years, computers are getting 10 times cheaper which is an old trend that has held since 1941 at least, since this man, Konrad Zuse, built the first working program-controlled computer in Berlin. And he could, could do roughly one operation per second, one. And then, 10 years later, for the same price, one could do 100 operations. 30 years later, 1 million operations for the same price. And today, after 75 years, we can do a million billion times as much for the same price. And the trend is not about to stop because the physical limits are much further out there. Rather soon, in not so many years, or decades, we will for the first time have little computational devices that can compute as much as a human brain. And if the trend doesn't break, 50 years later, there will be a little computational device for the same price that can compute as much as all 10 billion human brains taken together. And there will not only be one of those devices, but many, many, many. Everything is going to change. Already in 2011, computers were fast enough such that our deep learning methods for the first time could achieve a superhuman uh, pattern recognition result. That was the first superhuman result in the history of computer vision. And back then, computers were 20 times more expensive than today. So today, for the same price, we can do 20 times as much. And just a um, few, um, five years ago, five years ago, when computers were 10 times more expensive than today, we already could um, win for the first time medical imaging competitions. What you see behind me is a slice through the female breast. And the tissue that you see there has all kinds of cells. And normally, you need a trained doctor, 
a trained histologist who is able to detect the dangerous cancer cells or pre-cancer cells. Now, our stupid network knows nothing about cancer. It knows nothing about vision. It knows nothing in the beginning, but we can train it to imitate the human teacher, the doctor. And it became as good or better than the best competitors. And very soon, all of medical diagnosis is going to be superhuman. And it's going to be mandatory because it's going to be so much better than the doctors. After this, all kinds of uh, medical imaging startups were founded focusing just on this because it's so important. We can also use LSTM to train robots. One important thing I want to say is that we not only have systems that slavishly imitate what humans show them. No, we also have AIs that set themselves their own goals. And like little babies, invent their own experiment to explore the world and to figure out what you can do in the world without a teacher. And becoming more and more general problem solvers in the process by learning new skills on top of old skills. And this is going to scale. We call that artificial curiosity. Or a recent buzzword is power play. Learning to become a more and more general problem solver by learning to invent, like a scientist, one new interesting goal after another. And, and it's going to scale. And I think in not so many years from now, for the first time, we are going to have animal-like AI. We don't have that yet. On the level of a little crow, which already can learn to use tools, for example, or a little monkey. And once we have that, it may take just a few decades to do the final step towards human-level intelligence because technological evolution is about a million times faster, a million times faster than biological evolution. And biological evolution needed 3.5 billion years to evolve a monkey, a monkey from scratch. But then just a few tens of millions of years afterwards to evolve human level intelligence. We have a company which is called Nascence, like birth in English, Nascence, but spelled in a different way, which is trying to make this a reality and build the first true general purpose AI. At the moment, almost all research in AI is very human centric. And it's all about making human lives longer and healthier and easier and making humans more addicted to their smartphones. But in the long run, AIs are going to, especially the smart ones, are going to set themselves their own goals. And I have no doubt in my mind that they are going to become much smarter than we are. And what are they going to do? Of course, they are going to realize what we have realized a long time ago, namely that most of the resources in the solar system, or in general, are not in our little biosphere. They are out there in space. And so, of course, they are going to emigrate. And, of course, they are going to use trillions of self-replicating robot factories to expand in form of a growing AI bubble which within a few hundred thousand years is going to cover the entire galaxy by senders and receivers such that AIs can travel the way they are already traveling in my lab by radio from sender to receiver, wireless. So what we are witnessing now is much more than just another industrial revolution. This is something that transcends humankind and even life itself. The last time something so important has happened was maybe 3.5 billion years ago when life was invented. A new type of life is going to emerge from our little planet and it's going to colonize and transform the entire universe. The universe is still young. It's only 13.8 billion years old. It's going to become much older than that, many times more, many times older than that. So there's plenty of time to reach all of it, 
or all of the visible part, totally within the limits of light speed and physics. A new type of life is going to make the universe intelligent. Now, of course, we are not going to remain the crown of creation. Of course not. But there is still beauty in seeing yourself as part of a grander process that leads the cosmos from low complexity towards higher complexity. It's a privilege to live at a time where we can witness the beginnings of that and where we can contribute something to that. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>